At the conference, I want to get into the number a little bit because that's what all the adjusters are going to be talking about, right? But what if they accept this proposal for settlement that needs to be 75 less, I mean 25% less than what we actually think we can get. The PFS is not a typical settlement proposal, right? This is an official settlement that is filed with the court. They do not know the amount, right? But it's essentially a mechanism to put the other side on the hook for attorney fees and costs. We got to pay attention to that, pay attention to the timelines, get ready to start filing CRNs. If you're not comfortable with it, talk to your attorney, right? You know, see if your attorney is going to work out something for you. You guys are doing good work together for business, right? And they'll make it happen. It's going to help them get their fees paid, right? Right. The new law changes is what has changed that. But before that's what everybody was doing, right? Before you would go into appraisal, you would file a CRN because they would have to cure the bad faith within the 60 days right. in the appraisal. Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. Okay, okay, okay. We are here with the man, the myth, the legend. Some of you may not know who this person is, but I'm telling you right now that you want to know who this person is because this person has some very valuable information, particularly for those who live in Florida and are dealing with insurance claims and are dealing with the, with the insurance companies and fighting battles and getting denials and getting underpayments and not sure what to do. David Dubay, the owner, CEO, bad mother of logical of the logical firm is on with me today and is going to be speaking at advocates united on november 16th david welcome thank you sir thanks Vince. that's it just thanks like come on give me more than that excited bro super excited oh, man let's get it going so david is going to be david i first want to thank you like seriously thank you for trusting in myself and my team uh for being the platinum diamond headline sponsor and and supporter of this event like seriously i'm sure you know like what goes on in the background of these things and it's it's a lot it's a lot of cost it's a lot of work it's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes so i want to appreciate i want to say thank you uh for your support and i want you to know that I trust in you to do it because frankly, I know that you've got valuable information. You and I talk very often. We love to talk shop. We love to talk claims. Uh, you are an attorney. Uh, you've been in this business for a long time. Not only that, what I admire about you, David, is you also are a former roofer. You know what it's like to be in the grind. You know what it's like to get up on that roof and do those inspections and chalk it up and put together an estimate and so on and so forth. You are unique in your experience to be handling these claims and fighting with the opposing counsels and with the attorneys on trying to do good for the insured. So I want to thank you for all of that. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity, man. I definitely wanted to be a part of this once you uh, put that out there. So you and I spoke a couple of weeks ago and you already know, obviously, and anybody living in Florida knows that uh, we no longer have attorney fees and cost statute. So that means our, and by our, I mean public adjusters and obviously uh, homeowners as well. But I always say our, 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 what was it? Like our ace in the hole or, 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 or like bazooka in the back to put you down like that's gone now like i always say the public adjuster's role is a first line of defense you know and no longer no longer do we have the 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 backing no longer do we have the bullies in the back to make sure that if we can't get it done we know that you guys in the background can get it done however you think that that's okay like we're gonna be okay right yep so like you pointed out, it's not that we're not there, right? We're still here. It's just now we got to work off of a percentage, right? We're not entitled to our statutory fees. So the reality is, is that that becomes very difficult and burdensome for our client, right? They could be getting maybe 50% of their indemnification removed uh, upon settlement. But the title of my presentation is attorney fees are not dead, right? This is going to be the future of 
of first party property and insurance litigation. And um, like you pointed out, uh, I'm extremely passionate about this topic. I'm super excited to get on stage and talk about this because after this statute came out, the environment, right, and the mood within this industry really changed. Um, a lot of people got unmotivated. There were a lot of talks, right? Adjusters are like, oh, what are we going to do? You know, we're going to phase out all of that. And I really honestly believe that that's completely untrue. Uh, I really do. Uh, I've dedicated my entire adult life to this industry. You know, I started in roofing when I was 19, became an adjuster, thousand inspections, appraisals, went through law school doing this, right? And um, definitely not going to just, you know, lay down, right? Uh, all I want for this industry is for it to continue to prosper, right? And not only for us to make money, right? That's an obvious, but for us to continue to protect policyholders because it's needed, right? It's especially when the, you know, legislation like this um, is, is put forth. So but, the title of your presentation is attorney fees are not dead. Yes, sir. That's exactly. I thought they, what do you mean? I thought they were, what are you talking about? So what I'm going to be talking about is the proposal for settlement. Okay. The proposal for settlement, that's, you know, a lot of adjusters have heard this term before, right. And have run into it. They don't, necessarily understand what it is what it does the implications so uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about that also um, known as pfs also known as pfs exactly the pfs so the pfs is not a typical settlement proposal right this is an official settlement that is filed with the court they do not know the amount right but it's essentially a mechanism to put the other side on the hook for attorney fees and costs okay the defense has been using this against us forever, right? And a lot of adjusters have had that situation before where you get that very uncomfortable phone call from your attorney, right? And they tell you, hey, look, we're, you know, two years in, three years in, and we're not going to be moving forward with trial, right? Uh, and usually the reason is because the defense has filed a proposal for settlement, PFS, right? That has been presented to the client. We're about to go to trial. And we tell them, hey, look, if we lose, you could be on the hook for attorney fees and costs, right? That's the way the defense has utilized this this whole time. Client says, mm, I don't like it, right? I'm not willing to risk that. Let's shut it down. What is the advantage for being on the plaintiff side? At that point, we could, one, take the PFS. Two, we can take a walkaway settlement, which is usually what happens. Sometimes a nominal settlement, get some money, right? This is a defense is not trying to push it off. Or last case scenario, we can just dismiss the case altogether. And yeah, it could be on the hook for cost. Very rarely do they go after you, right? Now the way it works, if the defense, okay, is the one that presents this proposal for settlement. Uh, let's make it clear because people always get confused. Defense is defending the insurance company. The plaintiff, the, the plaintiff side is defending the insured. Exactly. So the defense, we're talking about insurance company, insurance company attorneys put forward a proposal for settlement. If we go to trial, we, the plaintiffs, would need to get at least 75% of that number. So I'll give you an example. Insurance company provides a proposal for settlement for $100,000. If we go to trial, we would need to get 75,000 or more to not be on the hook for their fees. Because remember, they're the ones that filed it. Okay, so they filed their proposal for settlement. They create a threshold. That threshold is 100 grand. The rule when they file is we need to get at least 75% of that number in a judgment. If we don't, let's say it's 70 grand that the jury awards, then could be on the hook for attorney fees and costs, right? So this is now, we are going to be utilizing the same mechanism, okay? How does it work? One important thing, it needs to be filed 91 days into the lawsuit. So no earlier than 90 days after they're served. So we gotta wait, okay? After we file, they got 30 days to accept it or reject it. They do. They do, the, and they means the defendant, right? So we, the plaintiff, are now filing a proposal for settlement. The way it works is this. When we file the proposal for settlement, and this is the caveat, this is the interesting part, this is what we're 
we're going to talk about. We have to get 25% above the number that we provide in the proposal for settlement. Meaning, we provide a proposal for a settlement as the plaintiff for $100,000. We would then need to get a judgment of $125,000 to trigger the PFS and be entitled to our attorney fees and costs. So that number that we use as the plaintiff is going to be the interesting thing, right? But there's only two scenarios here, Vince, right? It's either insurance company accepts the PFS, right? Or they don't. If they don't, at that point, we're entitled to our attorney fees and costs, right? They want to settle this case. That's what we're going to be asking for, for release. And if they do, case is settled, right? right. People get their percentage and we move on. So what I want to talk about at Advocates United is let's present these scenarios, right? Do we think that the insurance companies are just going to go around accepting every PFS that we file? Highly unlikely. And if they do, case is settled, right? But if they don't, we are almost in the exact same position as long as the PFS is legit, which is pretty simple, has to be reasonable and not ambiguous. We're entitled to fees again. But what's the insurance company's incentive to not settle, not, not accept it? What's their incentive? Well, think about that, Vince. If they go accepting all these PFSs, every PA is going to be like, hey, tell the client from the beginning, they'll deny it, but once we present the PFS, they're going to settle. It's not going to happen. The insurance company is not going to just say, because we thought you had no merit on the case, cases that they say we have no merit on all the time that we win, they're not all of a sudden now going to say, you know what, because we don't want to be on the hook for fees, here you go. But why not? I, that's what I'm assuming they're going to do. They say, wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. Well, then you're saying they're going to pay every claim. What's the problem with that? That's essentially what you're telling me then. But, they're- I mean, you would think, in a, in a perfect world, you would think that uh, they would try to avoid, because the attorney fees and costs, you know, I don't usually like to ask about my attorney's business. You know, a lot of times, a lot of different attorneys, I know you, I think you do sometimes, but you'll send like the breakdown of what everybody gets paid and stuff like that. Um, A lot of attorney fees and costs, that stuff adds up quick. And I can see how by accepting it, not only do they not have to pay the attorney fees and costs, but they're not going to have to pay the extra 25%. What other 25%? Because you said that if they don't accept if they don't accept the proposal for settlement, that means we have to settle for 25% more than what yeah, the proposal for settlement was. Yeah. If we go to trial, you would have to get a judgment over 25%. If we go to trial. If you don't go to trial. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So that's uh, the interesting part. The practical part of this is most of the time they're going to settle before. Of course. And we're going to be settling our attorney fees and costs. 15 years, 15, 15 years, David, I've never been to trial. There we go. All right. So let, let's talk about this, right? You, I want to go back to your point. You would think that it makes sense, but Vince, what type of standard is the carrier? Think about all the claims, man. Think about this. Some PAs that there's a kitchen, there's a bathroom. They're not just going to go from zero to whatever number you want in the PFS just because they're, they're trying to avoid fees. That's why they fight cases all the time. Not all case, but, but a lot of cases do go to trial. It depends on the attorney you work with, right? Some of them are more real. Some guys want to take it there, you know? And sometimes it, it, you have to. But practical, they're probably going to settle. A lot of the time, if they don't accept the PFS, we're going to be suddenly for our fees. So what I'm trying to say is, I think this is going to be utilized in every single case because there's no reason why a plaintiff's attorney wouldn't do it. There's no downside here for us. What right? are you what are you doing within those first 90 days? Well what, what would you think an attorney do, right? They so let's point this out. We can only essentially be entitled to our attorney fees from after the proposal for settlement is filed. So any work we did before that, okay, we're not entitled to. So what are most attorneys going to do? And again, this has to be an honest 
discussion with the client, the BA, we're probably going to send a complaint and wait for an answer. Probably not going to send discovery initially, right? Or get within that, you know, rigmarole before the PFS is filed. That, but again, if it's for the potential for the client to save 33.3, 30, 25, whatever it is that the arrangement is, I do believe that a lot of clients and adjusters are going to be on board, right? You're also telling the client, if we do go to trial, which is a possibility, if we file this thing, you could not have to pay 33.3, 30% of whatever it is that you're going to get. So in my opinion, this has to be utilized on every single case. And if you're talking about a $10,000 kitchen, a little bathroom, of course, right? Because it makes no sense for you not to, if they accept the proposal for settlement, hey, you make, very, you make your percentage done. If they don't, then as an attorney, you can, on a $10,000 kitchen claim, they still might be on the hook for 10, 15, 20, 25, whatever, in attorney fees, depending on where it goes, right? So let's go back to the scenarios, Vince. They can either just accept it and reject it. We got two things that are gonna happen. They accept it, case is done. They don't, now we're entitled to attorney fees and cost, right? As we move forward. If we're gonna, they're gonna try to settle with us on a release, we're asking for that, right? So that's the overall gist of this. At the conference, I wanna get into the number a little bit because that's what all the adjusters are gonna be talking about, right? But what if they accept this proposal for settlement that needs to be 75 less, I mean 25% less than what we actually think we can get. That's going to be the interesting part, because if you're also an adjuster who's throwing in the tile flooring all over a house, that you might not get that in trial because it's not justified, then you might have to revamp that that estimate or that number when it's you're going to provide the proposal for selling. That's what I wanted to get to next. Like, what is it that you're doing in preparation for those 90 days is really what I wanted to get to in like in the proposal for settlement that you're going to be presenting. Like, is if I have a hundred thousand dollar claim and I have a hundred thousand dollar estimate and you present a proposal for settlement for, let's just say $50,000. And let's say the client's like, whatever, you know, like, is that proposal for settlement of $50,000? Is that like final? Does that like put you in a hole for when you're trying to negotiate later on in the claim? Like, Hey, well you had a PFS for $50,000 and now you want 75, get out of here. No, that's, that's the interesting part. The proposal for settlement is essentially just that mechanism. And that's why, they better accept it or not, because if we come later, we can go for whatever we want. And I'll get into another caveat. But the number, let's talk about preparation for the 90 days. This is going to become essential. Proposal for settlement is going to become the focus in that first 90 days. And what is the actual focus of the proposal? The monetary term, which is the number. So what we got to do is talk to the client, get real world numbers, be ready for us to all be on the same page about what number are we happy with if it after, is accepted. after everyone gets paid exactly so my advice and what i'm doing is i'm sending a proposal for settlement acceptance to the client with a breakdown this is what we're going to offer this is what your pa is getting this is what we're getting this is your net sign off then we file until the client agrees that we're going to file this instrument and they understand what it does we don't do it that's my advice yeah. And I like that because the idea behind that is that if it is indeed a number that may not be to where the client wants it, but whatever, it will rid them of continuing this process and they'll be like, they'll just be, uh, you know, they'll just accept it. Then at least if they do accept the PFS, it's a number that they're just like, okay, fine. At least this headache is done. I no longer have to proceed. And then if they don't accept it, then, Hey, let's go. Sky's the limit. <laughs> there you go. So that's the two, that's the, that. That's the, that's the two-sided coin, right? It's that it's done. They might not be as happy, but they accepted that number. They're willing to take it. And if they don't, they could have just saved 33.3, 30, 20, whatever it is that you have agreed to with your attorney on that case, they could save that on the back end. So that's the other thing that you have to explain to the client when you're presenting this to them, right? It's, hey, look, this is these are the two benefits, right? And this is the reason why we think it's in your best interest to provide this number, right? Now, what I'm doing, not what every attorney is going to do, but if I'm providing a proposal for settlement, maybe I'm 
dropping that percentage, right? If I sign them up for 30, I tell the client, well, if we're going to present a proposal for settlement, I only take 20 of that, 15, whatever it is. Yeah, your right? public adjuster's taking 10, 20. I'm going to take a little bit less. Yeah, I got you. Back. So that if that number does get accepted for whatever reason, right? Claim is done. We made a concession. Client's happy. If they mm -hmm. don't, we ride off into the sunset, right? Business as usual. I like it. David, put yourself in the defense shoes. What are they, what are they thinking here? Do you, do you know, like, what are, what are they, they're receiving this proposal for settlement of $50,000 on a hundred thousand dollars. Are uh, I don't know if I can ask you this, but are you presenting an offer with just a dollar amount or are you presenting an estimate as well? Well, the PFS, we're going it's just off a document. the document, whatever they read. It's just a number, but okay. they're still looking at the estimate to okay. say, okay, what can these people potentially get at trial, right? Is this a legitimate PFS? You know what I mean? But the PFS is just a number. You're not revising the estimate in any way because when we go to trial, this is what we're presenting. The Got it. jury does not even know what that number is and will never know the proposal for settlement. What it does, what threshold they need to make, none of that, right? So that's the good part about it. Now, talking about the defense, you almost led me into literally the last thing I really want to talk about that is the most interesting part about all of this. I'm at Windstorm Conference this past year, January. Law just passes. I run into a friend of mine from law school who just so happens to have already moved up to be a supervising attorney at a pretty big defense firm. Me and him are having some discussions, and he does not seem at all phased right, by the legislation. He's like, it's not a big deal. It's not really going to favor us that much. Defense attorney. I'm like super confused at this moment, right? And he's like, man, how are we going to accept the PFS if there's a CRN? And I'm like, okay, not really registering too much. We keep talking a little bit, start doing some research. And this is the most interesting part of the whole scenario for us on the plaintiff side. In this PFS, there can be included no non-monetary terms, okay? So if we send them a PFS and they accept it, but there's a CRN lingering, that does not get them out of bad faith. That was an amendment to a civil procedure rule. I think it's 1.442 by the Supreme Court yeah, but they're just going to provide a release for you to sign that's going to, well, I mean, obviously. On Vince, but that release has nothing to do with the proposal for settlement. The mechanism and the threshold has been set by the proposal. You want a release, you got to call me outside of that. And we're talking a new number. And it doesn't change yeah. at all. But Vince, that's the biggest thing, right? If I'm offering you 50, we got a $100,000 estimate. If you call me, so to so settle on a release, the number's not 50, the number's now 75, right? Those are different terms. And it doesn't, it doesn't take away anything from my PFS. If they don't accept it in 30 days, Vince, we're entitled to attorney fees and costs, regardless. If they so, don't accept the PFS in 30 days? Exactly. And how can they accept it if there's, if there's a, a CRN? Then bring bad faith claim. Real quick, I like to educate CRN, also known as the Civil Remedy Notice. It is a bad faith complaint. Uh, it is something that you know that we actually normally try to handle in house. It used to be status quo for us, like anytime there was a denial, uh, underpayment, uh, just pretty much a lot of just pretty much you could you could relate a lot of stuff that happens in a claim uh, in the life of a claim to bad faith. The yep. issue we had though, David, was God. Damn, is it time consuming to do yep. to do them? So we're a little bit more picky with that. But I will say for people to understand, <clears throat> a bad faith complaint is completely separate to the actual build back costs to pay for your insurance claim. So, for example, if you have a hundred thousand dollar estimate to build back your hurricane torn up home, that's great. You settle for seventy five thousand dollars. But if you filed a bad faith complaint, you can get an additional seventy five or a hundred. I call it kind of like pain and suffering. Is that a good example? You know, what it is is called punitive damages. It's punishment damages, right? And that's where you can get three times compensatory and those things. They want to do is they want to punish the bad faith. 
right? And that's essentially how how they do it, right? These are punitive damages. These are so, one, they want to make a point. Um, what are those actions not to happen again? What well, are let me, let me tell before you ask the next thing, Vince is going to be very important to start fighting those things again because of this, right? Yeah, so yeah, everybody's dynamic is going to change a little bit as we see all of this play out. I just put in here hire someone to specialize in CRNs. They're they're tough, dude. They're tough. They're they're tough. tough. And, and but, if you want it to be legit, you got to do it right. And right? I'm gonna say I like I talk about business at all and hiring the right people. I'm gonna tell you right now, you better hire somebody with a lot of patience and very high attention to detail because it is a drag. Um. So you have 90. So, okay. So what I know about the CRN is that they have 60 days to respond. Right. Mm -hmm. But what to I cure. also know. To cure. Responding is not good enough. They got 60 days to cure the actual bad faith. It means settle it out. Right. Oh, that but they, but they think that when they respond, it's all done. Yeah, of course. Responding but I also. To CRN is not legit. Basically. But I also know that in that 60 days, there's not really much that can be done. Am I correct? Yes. In terms of what? So like I can't file an appraisal after I file a CRN. That's the specific thing. Right? Um, yes, you can. But recently, that just changed. Before, you were able to file right before appraisal, right? The new law change is, is what has changed that. But before, that's what everybody was doing. Right before you would go into appraisal, you would file a CRN because they would have to cure the bad faith within the 60 days right. in the appraisal. Right. And usually that wouldn't happen. And then you were to go ask for terms outside of that. Oh, crap. I had a question and I forgot. Oh, but, quick tip for you. I would really love for you to do this. And I think it would go a long way with a big fat picture of your logo at the top. One thing that I've been struggling with, David, is every, it feels like every quarter there's new law changes. Do you think that you could possibly create some kind of like handout of like some of these time limits and some of these different things that are going on in the state of Florida? Because they, because it ain't 90 days anymore. Now it's 60 days. Uh, they have to provide a settlement, right? Uh, I think they have to provide a coverage decision uh, 30 days after having the inspection or receiving an estimate or a proof of loss. There's like all these like little things now that are, are they keep changing. So it's, one thing that DFS has actually done well is they have all that on their website and it's actually broken down in timeline from the different law changes and you can actually click on it and go through it. Um, so the, the DFS website actually is very good with that. And that goes, the, the law changes that happen that are advantageous to us really help the CRN. And that's the last thing that I wanted to point out. It's like, okay, now as an adjuster, it's not 90 days anymore. It's 60 days, right? So let's pay attention to if they're not making a determination in 60 days, that's going in the CRN. It reduces now the time for an insurance company to review a claim communication from 14 days to seven days. So they're not responding in seven days, part of the CRN, right? Insurance company beginning an investigation used to be 14 days. Now it's seven days. They don't, part of the CRN, right? Physical inspection used to have to be 45 days. Now it's 30 days. Another thing to include in the CRN, right? And one of the interesting caveats is that the insurance company needs to send the adjuster's estimated report for damages to the policy order seven days after it's completed. Can you show, can you share with me the link? Do you have it, happen to have it? I will show you right now what i also so david what I, what i realized we're expanding to many different states across the country and i know you're not technically legally allowed because you're not you know i know you're a, you're a licensed attorney here in florida and you're not you know licensed in other places so if you don't know that's okay but a lot of states i've noticed do not have attorney fees and cost statutes most is this, do you know, is this a similar approach that other attorneys are taking in different states or is this more of like a Florida specific thing? 
Is the is the is the PFS something that's like known nationwide? I I don't know. Is that like a common thing in in attorney worlds? Proposal yeah, for settlements. Yeah, and it's used. This was used more in personal injury. This was used more in personal injury than any other than any other you know area of law uh, action. But, so um, so when an attorney in Connecticut comes to me and says we're not taking anything under hundred thousand dollars, can I just say hey? Do you guys have like a proposal for settlement statute that gets your attorney fees and costs paid for? Or is that a stupid question? No, that's a great question. And I, I and I wouldn't know if all other states have it, right? I know that it is very prominent here in Florida. And I can tell you right now, the more important one that I know that you might be asking about is in Texas. Well, they have the bad faith thing there. I know, like there, you could you could file all day for bad faith, and and we already know that insurance companies they 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 bad faith claims all the time. Yeah, not the bad faith, but the proposal for settlement. I think it's called offer of settlement rule in Texas, and it, and it does play very similar. But again, I don't know the particulars, you know. But it's definitely something to ask because there are forms of it you know, throughout the U.S. All right. So you're going to be speaking to a room full of mostly public adjusters. You are speaking to a lot of public adjusters right now on this podcast. What do you suggest? What do you recommend uh, the public adjusters do um, after hearing this information, knowing that, hey, look, there's a there's an actual process here, uh, a very good process that whichever one happens, you know, should end up with a semi happy client, at least, you know, hey, if this is what they're accepting, this is what they're accepting. And then if it goes on, they're not going to have to pay attorney fees and costs. So no matter what, even if it ends up with an attorney, because I will tell you the public adjuster mindset, especially now we're just like, I'm going to tell actually, I'm going to speak from the public adjuster. We're like, we don't even know how to sell this. Like, okay, all right. So yeah. this this is this is this is the public adjuster, David. Claim is severely underpaid. The, the the insurance company knows that they could break our balls until the end of freaking time because they think in their mind, what are you gonna do about it? So we're having trouble with our pitch, right? To the client saying, Hey, so it used to be. I think you should file a lawsuit. Don't worry. It's no cost to you. You don't have to worry about anything. You have nothing to lose. Just go for it. The easiest pitch in the world. Now it's like, well, my fee is 10 or 20% and the attorney is going to charge you 33%, but he may give you a break of 25%. But even if it's 25%, you add on my 20%, it's going to be 45%. We're going to take half of your claim. And they're just like, yeah, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. It happens a lot now. Like you're losing a lot of cases because we can't really, we're not really sure how to pitch it. So what do you, I'm not asking you, I don't, I don't want to ask the question. I don't, I don't want to ask you for the pitch, but what do you I actually just, like the pitch, right? Cause remember I used to be an adjuster. So, so what's, I so the, what's pitch. the pitch? I feel the pain, right? One, you got to talk to your attorneys and for us, it sucks too, but they got to incorporate the proposal for settlement into the pitch, right? In terms of having them understand, Hey, there's a chance, right? How we're going to do that, that takes time, right? And for the client to even understand, fathom what that is, is pretty difficult. But as an adjuster, it's really the attorney that needs to really handle that pitch. And the pitch is, the claim is open, right? Determination is there. Damage to your property has been notated. Right? I wouldn't have filed it if I didn't think it was a good claim. What benefit do you gain from stopping right now? That's the question you have to present to the client, right? Claim is open. Damage has been noti you know, notified to the carrier of the condition of your property, right? Could potentially get non-renewed coming up, right? Why, why wouldn't you proceed? That's what needs to be presented to them. Right now we're at zero dollars, under deductible, five grand, whatever. Even if it's an additional, it's more than where you are. It's not ideal. And you need to sit, you know, be empathetic to the client about that. And let them know this is tough for us too, right? This is how we functioned forever, you know? And it's unfortunate. And the insurance company, the legislation are, are against us, right? And this is the best that we can do. But for the client, it's not in your best interest to just drop this right now. Right. Because you're going to get zero, right? And your roof 
especially with roof claims, is going to need to get replaced anyway. So if you get $10,000, right, it's better than zero because you're going to have to put 20 into the roof anyway. That's right? interesting because didn't the new laws that they pass, if you have a 10-year-old plus roof, that the insurance company is going to send somebody out there to inspect and determine whether they could, yeah, right? That's like a new thing now too. I forgot about that. Yeah, you need to get an inspection. I believe it's 15. Um, but talking about that, let's pull up this... Uh, Let's, uh, can I screen share? I don't know if I have you allowed. Let's yeah, see. Yeah. yeah. Right here. This is where you're looking at. Oh, cool. So my Florida dot, we're going to yeah. put it in the description, but my Florida CFO.com slash division slash ICA slash property insurance changes. Look at this. It's basically broken out for you by Senate bills and everything. So, um, it makes it really simple to kind of go down. Simple for you. It reads all kinds of like case studies and right case here. laws and stuff. Well, this is the main part that you, that you want that you guys want to go down to. It's special session, the Senate Bill Two A. This is what awards of attorney fees are. Talk about some of the benefits, but here's you know claim filing deadlines, and then this is where we need to prompt pay laws for property insurance. This is the important section right here for all public adjusters. Nice. It is the one you guys really want to pay attention to. And these are the things that we need to be using in the CRN, right? The, the insurance carrier are not used to these timelines right now. They're just not, right? Neither, so, but neither are we. Neither are we. And I know okay. we're I know we're dropping the ball on a lot of these claims. I'm not gonna lie. Let me give this back to you. Um so and, and again, that's why everybody's process needs to change. Has the has the game gotten a little bit more difficult? Is it a little bit more work? Yeah, you know. But for us to continue to do what we're doing, protect the policyholder, put us in the best position to succeed, right? These are the things PAs need to be doing. Pay attention to those timelines. Make notes about it, right? If there's a leak in the house, okay, and they haven't found the cause, and the carrier hasn't sent out leak detection, that that's in your CRM, right? That's something that is not showing a good faith investigation. Is that reasonable for the carrier to be like, oh, we don't know where it's coming from tonight? It's not necessarily a reasonable investigation. We got to pay attention to that. Pay attention to the timelines. Get ready to start filing CRMs. If you're not comfortable with it, talk to your attorney, right? You know, see if your attorney is going to work out something for you. You guys are doing good work together for business, right? And they'll make it happen. It's going to help them get their fees paid. Right, because again, let's go back to the scenario before we close this out. We, the plaintiff, file a proposal for settlement. There is a legitimate lingering CRN. If they accept that proposal for settlement, we could still go after bad faith. That means three times compensatory, a lot of money for them. So they can't really accept it if it's legit. They got to reach out to us separately and say, "Hey, we want to try to get this resolved upon a release." And at that point, I say, oh, if you want a release, it's not 50, 75, right? If they don't like that number, what happens? They don't accept the BFS, they don't settle, and now we're entitled to fees and costs, Oof. right? I, I look, man, when I talked to you about this a few weeks ago, I was just like, it's great. It makes, it makes perfect sense to me, you know? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, I like the part where you're just going to break the whole thing down to the client as well. And you're just going to be like, here, like, this is what you're oh. going to end up with. Like, well, first, like, what's a number? like real, super, super realistically, even maybe a little bit pain, maybe it hurts a little bit, but you know, at least it'll get the claim over and done with what's a number that you'd be like, okay with. And let's, the number, right? What happens if the insurance companies just start accepting these PFSs? We start pushing that number up a little bit, right? Not unjustified, still below our estimate amount, of course, but maybe we're not gonna be as conservative. I mean, that's natural, right? Just like if people are willing to pay a price for something, that company starts to increase the price if the demand is still there, right? So that's what's going to happen here too. So I think it's going to be very difficult for them to, one, just go accepting these things. Right? Yeah. The big thing is going to be on us. How are we handling the PFS? We're we doing everything timely. Is the CRN in? Is the number good? Are you communicating with the client? Right? You got those things in a process. We're, we're not in a bad spot. Attorney fees are very far from dead. Very far. Got it. That's awesome. All right. That's great. That's great news.
It's Oops. still alive. The industry is still alive. Exactly. Exactly. Alive That's and well. So I come to talk about it, right? Everybody's like just so down, you know, like I have PAs that are like, you know, am I even going to be able to be a PA in the future? You know, it's like, I know. It's, it's, right? it's tough. It's tough. It's, it's tough to find a claim these days. It's not like it used to be. It's a little bit more difficult to find a claim these days, but you know, it is what it is. I like it. I like it. David, thank you so much for coming on my friend. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for coming to this event. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait for, for the crowd to hear what you've got to say, uh, in more detail of what you said. Now you're going to be joining my, my team next week in one of our weekly trainings. So I'm excited about that. Uh, thank you for doing that. And just, um, yeah, man. David Dubé is the man, guys. If you want to make open communication is very important to me, David, and you've always been there. Anytime I always said, uh, when it comes to an attorney, all I ask is that you answer my freaking phone. And you have always done that. So public adjuster, if you're looking for an attorney that will answer your freaking phone, Dave is definitely that one. And what I like about you actually answer the question. You don't just say, Well, just send it over to me and we'll take care of it. It's like, no, you actually answer the question. So I appreciate that too, man. You got to, man. Thank you, Vince. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to everything. I appreciate the opportunity, dude. Um, and yeah, see you in Miami. See you on Zoom with a group or the team next week. Nice. All right, David. Thanks, man. See you later.